back to Urgent Word. We're in the middle of the book of Galatians, and today I'm going to ask us to go towards the end of the letter because this is one of Paul's most heated sections. You see, last time we talked about this skipping of a thanksgiving message, and Paul only does this in three letters. And each of those letters, Galatians, 1 Timothy, and Titus, they deal with false teachers. So enter opponents. Here they come. Who are they? We're doing our best to eavesdrop well, to do some espionage. Theology professor Roger Nicole says that interpreting the New Testament is like reading a mystery novel. I'm inviting you to do some espionage. So remember, Paul is writing an urgent word to churches in Galatia, and we're trying to understand what's so important. And as we see, it's a presence of people who have earned authority and influence within the church, who are offering a teaching that is problematic to faith in Jesus Christ. And maybe we're thinking like, well, why doesn't Paul want these guys in his church? What's, what's the problem? Is he not welcoming? That's not quite the picture. These people have gained influence and authority and are shaping the way people follow Christ. It's not just they're visiting. They're actually teaching. And they're teaching something that Paul finds deeply problematic. Paul's not the only one to deal with false teachers that show up in the church. People who have undue authority that are leading people away from the gospel that is about Jesus. The one that Jesus preached himself. The one that Jesus embodied. There are people that have twisted the message just a little bit to suit their preferences and their ideas about how to live and about what is good. Some of the most pointed words in the New Testament are dedicated to these people who are leading astray the people who have come to believe in Jesus and to follow him deeply. All right, partners, it's time to take a look at these wanted individuals. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe three different false teacher types that you find in the New Testament churches that appear in, in different authors come to address different problems created by these people who have gained authority and influence in the church, leading people astray from Jesus. Which one is Paul writing to address? There's the Epicurean Libertines, people who say, look, you can follow Jesus and pretty much do anything you want. Anything you want, anything you please, any impulse you have, it's fine. Follow Jesus and do anything. There's the proto-gnostic duelists. Now that's a mouthful. These guys are saying, body bad, spirit good. Jesus has given us some secret knowledge and he only seemed human. Uh, New Testament scholars call these guys docetists. Either the body is worth total neglect or you can do whatever you want with your body, but the body doesn't matter in your discipleship to Christ. And then there's the ethnocentric legalists, people who say, I hear you Gentiles, but you really have to do the Jewish way in order to follow Christ because Jesus was a Jew and he's inviting you to be one too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the text that Paul is very pointed. We're going to skip a little bit further on where he really comes out swinging at this group. And you tell me with your text espionage, which of these false teachers Paul is writing to address. Galatians chapter 5, verse 2 through 12. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Ooh, Paul is getting 
spicy guys this is some harsh words some urgent words about these guys there's some bad actors in the church that are teaching people that it really isn't about the love of Jesus it really isn't about faith in Christ you actually have to become an ethnic Jew in order to follow Christ through circumcision so who is Paul after in this text You've got it, the ethnocentric legalists. So who wrote to call out the Epicurean libertines? Well, you can find an indictment against them in the book of Jude. What about the proto-Gnostic dualists, these docetists as the, the scholars call them? You'll find in the second letter of John uh, written against this group. And here in Galatians, we have a letter against these guys. And we might call their alias, the Judaizers. Yeah, we actually have the word Judaize here in the text we're going to revisit again. But for now, let's just ask this one question. What's the problem with these Judaizers? Well, let me make a summary of their position. They're advocating for salvation by works. As you hear Paul addressing the practice of circumcision here, remember Paul is talking to churches in a very multi-ethnic area. And the, the Christian movement, the movement of Christ, if you read through the New Testament, you, you understand that this started uh, as, a, as a messianic Jewish movement, that Jews took on this faith, believing who Jesus was because they they could see through the spirit, through the softening of their hearts, that this person, Jesus, was the anticipated Messiah of the Old Testament promises that they were so familiar with. And the movement, though, didn't stop with Jews. This movement of Jesus is actually for the whole world, just as, as the Bible started with a global scope in Genesis 1:11, and the mission of Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. So, it was never just meant to be a faith where people become Jews. It was meant to be a faith where people encounter the wonderful love of the cosmic God, Yahweh, revealed through Christ Jesus. So we have to consider with the Judaizers that Torah obedience was an ethnic marker. That circumcision is what made one a Jew. This obedience to the law is what made one a Jew. And they were arguing that in order to be part of the Jesus movement, this messianic Jesus movement, that Jesus followers become cultural Jews. Now, there's a lot going on here, and scholars, if you read anything about Galatians, there's a high focus on this faith versus works argument. That we follow Jesus by faith, or do we earn our way into salvation following Jesus through obeying the whole Old Testament law? This is part of the debate, but we need to look at this also with a lens that Judaizers, these people who, who had a deep respect for the Old Testament, which is not problematic at all, they assumed that Gentiles would have to become ethnic Jews through the work of, say, circumcision, taking on a key identity marker for Jews in order to fully follow Jesus. Are you starting to hear some of the issue with the Judaizers and how this is problematic to the central elements of the gospel that all can come to Christ, respond to his love, and receive the gift of salvation? You don't have to become a certain ethnic identity or cultural identity in order to be marked by Jesus. Yes, there are things we grow in Christ-likeness. We are invited to change, to assimilate, if you will, into kingdom culture. But if you read Revelation 7, 9, this is a every tribe, every tongue, every nation. While this faith versus works element is huge and has huge implications for how we approach our discipleship with Jesus and our relationship to him and our salvation, that you, you can't earn it, right? Our, our life of faith is a response to it, but not earning it. That's huge, and Paul's addressing that. But we need to understand this ethno-cultural dimension of Paul's issue with the Judaizers. In the context of this multi-ethnic Galatia, these Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ you don't have to be a Jew to follow Jesus. You don't have to become one of us in order to follow Jesus. 
in case we think that this idea that these threads of false teaching are somehow obsolete or they're not present in church life today or then that haven't shaped uh, American church history or the context we're in, I wonder what Paul would say about residential boarding schools in the U.S. and in Canada. These were places that were literally quote unquote invited to kill the Indian, save the man. And to do so, they would turn them into westernized American Christians. They had to leave their entire culture behind them in order to become Christianized. I wonder what Paul would say about this ethnocentric legalism that our own church traditions have participated in. I think too about the ethnocentric legalism of churches in the South during the era of Jim Crow, during the era of segregation. You see, this kind of false teaching, it's, it's not necessarily a thing of the past. This kind of division exists today. If you pay real close attention to church life, there are Epicurean libertines today, whether or not they would take that name. People who say you can follow Jesus and change nothing in your life. There are proto-Gnostic dualists, people who encourage you not to have a good and robust view of your body, of say sexuality, or of health. And there are people today who want people who follow Christ to look, talk, dress, act like a certain way, to become a certain culture in order for that to be a seal of their sign of following Christ. This urgent word might reach a little further than to the Galatian church. So I want to invite you to reflect. Are there any ethnocentric tendencies in churches in America today? Why is this problematic to the gospel and to following Jesus? <laughs>